Good evening, everybody. It's well, it's evening for me. I don't know what time you're watching this. My name is Greg Foley. I'm uh, a senior lecturer in DCU. And I suppose what I'm, this video is all about really is a follow up to um, a post I, I put up on LinkedIn last week where I was just flagging the fact that here in DCU and particularly in the School of Biotechnology, which I think most many of, of the people watching this video will, will have been through. Um, I just wanted to flag the fact that we're really trying at the moment to enhance our level of engagement with, with industry. Um, and we have particular reasons for doing that now, but it's something I think we've, we've always wanted to do and have tried to do. I mean, we obviously have our intra program, which um, ourselves and UL pioneered back in, in the 80s. Um, a lot of other universities kind of copied us. Um, so it's always been part of our ethos to be somewhat vocational. Um, so I don't want to keep everybody too long and I, I, I don't want this to go over 25 minutes or so. So I'll, I'll share my screen of a few slides, not, not hundreds of them, um, and just basically set out, give a little bit of background on DCU and the School of Biotechnology in the first place, uh, say where we've come from, where we are now and where we want to go. Um, and then say a few specific things about what we would like from industry and hopefully then at some stage we can we can get some process going where we we can advance and um, uh, the cooperation that, that i think we want i think industry probably wants but getting down to specifics is always the, the tricky bit so I'll, I'll share my screen now and get into my uh, my my powerpoint um dc futures so I'll try and get in here to full screen mode. Everything seems to go slowly when you're in Zoom. Okay. So I might make that a bit bigger. Okay, so the catalyst for, for this whole interaction really has been a thing that we call DCU Futures. Uh, and really, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about DCU Futures in a minute, but one of the key aspects of it is that we, we essentially want, and it's a requirement of our DCU Futures program to enhance industry university collaboration. So it's not something that that is going to be paying lip service to that kind of interaction. We, we really want tangible two-way interaction between us and industry. And, you know, I'm talking about things that are a lot more than just inviting speakers in, you know, and, and talking about their careers or whatever. We want it to be much more substance, substantive than that. Um, okay, so just for those who, people who don't know about DCU, if, you, if you're an international audience or whatever, uh, DCU has its its roots in the 1970s, actually, um, and so does University of Limerick, where it was felt at the time that in, in government that Ireland in particular, which was at the time was really only an emerging industrial country, it was still a very agriculture based country. and it was felt that our, our universities needed to be more attuned to the needs of the economy. Uh, so two institutions were formed, the National Institute for Higher Education in Dublin and the National Institute for Higher Education in Limerick. And these were essentially technological universities and um, they were unashamedly vocational. They had unusual programs, multidisciplinary programs. I mean, the, the BSc in biotechnology, which um, I'll talk about it again. Uh, that was a good example of it. That was a, a multidisciplinary program. Or I suppose we'd prefer to say it was interdisciplinary in the sense that it involved integrating biology with, with chemical or, or bioprocess engineering. Um, we pioneered the, the work placement concepts, which we call interest. So all our students do a work placement. And traditionally, that has varied from six months minimum. And, and if alumni out there were probably doing a six months intra, we've actually expanded it to nine months in, in recent years. Uh, and some of the business type uh, degree programs from DCU have a full year. Um, so we, we were a different kind of, of, of institute compared to the traditional universities at the time. And I suppose one of our, our defining um, ethos, if you like, was that fact that we were always, we tried to be student centered as possible. So. And a lot of that had to do with the fact that the staff at the time, the academic staff, were very young themselves. I, I was 23 when I started lecturing and um, a lot of my colleagues were also in, in their 20s. 
Um, but the, the NIH term didn't really have a great deal of traction internationally. In fact, I remember a colleague of mine getting a, a letter addressed to Porig Walsh uh, at the Northern Ireland Housing Executive Dublin, I mean, which is wrong on so many levels. So there was a strong push to, to, to turn us into a, a proper university, so to speak, and it actually kind of mirrors what, what has happened in Ireland in recent years for all our institutes of technology have been turned into technological universities. It was a very similar process uh, at that time. But we became a fully fledged university. There was no technological uh, moniker to it. And I suspect long term, that's the way our technological universities will go as well. So, so that's our background. We've always tried to be a little bit different from, the, from Trinity and UCD. Um, Partly because that's just the way we were, were built, so to speak, but also because it, it's, it's, a, it's a tactic or a strategy that we need to have because we're, Trinity and UCD are, are more well known, they're better resourced, everything, so, and they're in the same city as us. So we do have to be conscious that there is competition. I mean, the, the education sector is just like business. It is, it is a market and we need students um, simply to survive. It's the old issue of, of you, you just constantly need economic growth. It's same with, with uh, universities. We constantly need to, to grow our student numbers and that's not a bad thing for society in general. So where are we now? Well, for, for those of you who went to DCU quite a few years ago, the, the big event I suppose over the last decade was that we incorporated which is kind of a clever word, non-threatening word for taking over. We, we incorporated St. Pat's, which is, was the major uh, teacher education institution in Dublin. And so St. Pat's has essentially become our fifth faculty, which we call the Institute of Education. Uh, it's the only faculty of education actually in the university sector in Ireland. Um, in terms of just growth, undergraduate programs, you can see obviously we've more than doubled our undergraduate programs, but we've also seen a massive increase in postgraduate numbers, um, or I, I taught postgraduate numbers. We all obviously have very active PhD programs in right across the university, but these the, the taught programs, taught master's programs, are where there's been a huge amount of growth. And um, Obviously, there's there's a huge financial incentive for us to, to produce lots of master's degrees, but I think, you know, the whole issue of lifelong learning is is a, is a genuine issue that, that graduates have to address, the fact that they have to keep learning. So um, there is there is a lot of sense in, in providing master's programs, both general ones and very specific ones. Within the, the Faculty of Science and Health, again, we've evolved gradually. Um, our nursing program now is, is not quite dominant, but it, there are huge numbers coming into nursing. We have a psychology degree and our health and human performance, uh, which used to be called sports science and health, I think, for if, if you were in DCU 10 or 15 years ago. So there's been, a, as well as having maths, chemistry, biology and physics, we have these very health oriented um, degree programs and departments. In terms of research centers, we've loads of research centers. We've the NICB, which is the National Institute for Cellular Biotechnology. That's been around since, I suppose, about 1988, and it's still going strong. And we have the Water Institute, so we're a major center for environmental science um, and in, a, in a very multidisciplinary kind of a way, everything from social is issues related to water um, to sensor research and what have you. And then the Fraunhofer Project Center, which has to do with, a lot of that is to do with microfluidics and that kind of thing. In terms of facilities, then we've, the, the big one in recent years was the nano, uh, bio nano research facility. We just call it the NRF. Sometimes I can't remember what it's actually called, which is really a location for, I mean, some of the equipment in there is just phenomenal. The, 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 you know, the quantum tunneling microscopes and all sorts of stuff. So, so that acts as a general resource for scientists across the university. And then the, of, of most relevance for us in biotech is the microbial bioprocessing facility, which, you know, if you're an alumnus, you'll remember it as us 
calling it the, the pilot plant or the maybe even just the bioprocessing lab. And we've we put a five figure sum into that lab in, in the last few years. So I, I, I'm pretty confident saying that we've the best bioreactor facility for, for both teaching. And what we want to actually do more of is, is industrial engagement in terms of product development and process research and what have you. Um, so that, that's where that's kind of a little bit of our pride and joy at the moment because it's just when you walk in and you, we buy reactors from every scale from three and a half liters up to 150 liters and we have at the moment two companies in doing product development research so um, we want to actually extract the maximum out of this facility both in teaching and research so um, we're, we're really determined to, to make that happen. And one of my colleagues, Brian Freeland, is, is the main man for that. So um, if anyone is interested in actually using that facility at any stage, um, if you contact me in the first instance, and then I'll, I'll pass you on to Brian. So again, the School of Biotechnology, that's actually the micro, the, the MBF there behind you, uh, the text there in the, in the picture. Um, so there are two of our new bioreactors. They're the the three and a half liter ones, and they're most we try to hook them all up to, to computers with LabVIEW, um, and we've a whole bunch of them here as well. Older ones, which are low tech, I'd say, in, in from industry's perspective, but they they're fantastic. They do the job. Um, so if you, in terms of the degree programs we have now, an awful lot has changed over the years. We've got the BSc in biotechnology, obviously, which is our, our really our, our flagship program in many ways. It's, it's been, I think the first graduates were 85, possibly 85, I think it was. And I sometimes you, at talks like this, I use the word infested. Our graduates are everywhere. You know, you, you walk into any company in the pharma sector are, are similar in Ireland and you'll, you'll see a DCU graduate, um, whether it's Pfizer's out in Dean's Grange or, or BMS or whoever, are, and it's been a massive success story. And uh, where the achievements of some of our graduates, they, they sometimes make me feel desperately inadequate, but they, it's been because people have done so well. The, um, the, the reach of that program has been phenomenal. Um, I was just chatting to one of our alumni at the weekend. She was helping me out with an open day and she's a graduate PhD in Cambridge. So, you know, students have come through a small university in North Dublin, uh, often people who are from not the wealthiest of backgrounds. Uh, we, we always like to encourage as many students as we can from, from more disadvantaged backgrounds and support them. Um, but they're, what they've achieved has been uh, incredible in some cases. Our second flagship program now is the BSc in Genetics and Cell Biology, which is hugely popular with, with school leavers. They, school leavers love biology. Um, and they, that's around for about 15 years now, I think um, that was really built by our, our late colleague, Michael O'Connell, who, who people will remember if they're an alumnus. We've, we're heavily involved in the analytical science degree, which is a fantastic degree, I think. Again, a lot of those people, the graduates of that program have done extraordinarily well. It's not, it goes under the radar a bit because it doesn't have a fancy name, but, but the, some of our best ever biologists to come out of DCU have come from what we call the AS program. We have the BSc in environmental science and technology, which is shared between us, chemistry and physics and then we have we have two master's programs the master's in bioprocess engineering which is not really a master's in bioprocess engineering if I was be perfectly honest because it has no accreditation and it is it's it's really a master's in bioprocessing with a strong biopharma emphasis and then we've masters in diagnostics and precision medicine so and we have plans for masters in computational biology we have a very strong research group in neuroscience and we would hope at some stage to have another master's degree and um, with various streams in it, one of which might be neuroscience. So just to talk about the, the biotech degree and the, the genetics and, and cell biology degree, one of the 
the aspects of those degree programs is that they have a strong emphasis on biopharma. Um, and that really makes sense because as you know better than, than me, Ireland is one of the biggest producers of, of biopharmaceuticals in the world. And we, we have a massive, they employ massive numbers in Ireland and they're hugely important to the economy. So a few years ago, we looked at our programs and we decided that there was merit in streaming them. So that in final year, we, we offer students the choice of doing a research stream, which they do the traditional fourth year project or a biopharma stream. Now within the biopharma stream, they will they do these four modules here. Um, alumni will remember the commercial biotechnology uh, module that Tecla Ryan um, taught for many years. And in fact, I was chatting to Tecla a few days ago and she was reminiscing about the fact that one day, because it was kind of a hands-on type module where you know students had to solve problems in groups and what have you. Um, the students just down tools and wouldn't work. They were just, they were, it's, sometimes it's easier to sit in a lecture than actually take part in, in a little project, but, um, but that still exists. And then we have three more, and these modules are delivered by um, NIBERT, who the National Institute for Research and Training in Biotechnology, whatever, I can't remember the name of it, it's just NIBERT, and that's based in UCD. Um, and those lectures will be given to us by, provided for us by John Mill. And um, so that's a very strong partnership. And um, these modules would also be delivered on our master's program. So one of the things when I talk about the new art, where we're heading now, one of the issues that we have is that we have a very strong biopharma emphasis across our major programs. And whatever we do that's new, we don't want to just repeat ourselves and keep doing the same thing. We want any new programs to have put a bit of distance between themselves and our existing programs. There's no point in, in competing with ourselves. So I just won't move on. Okay, so where are we now? Uh, and and where, where do we want to go? Well, Again, I'd be perfectly honest with you, it is a market, the university sector and the government in its wisdom, and I, I think actually it's a good good decision. Um, for those not based in Ireland, we had a university sector comp comprised of seven universities and we had a whole string of regional colleges that were known as institutes of technology. And what the government is doing now is is merging those in institutes and turning them into what they're called technological universities. Um, I think in terms of international traction, I think it, it's a good move. And I think it might also make those institutes more attractive to students, which would spread the load over the, the, the country. I, I, I think it is sometimes these kind of merger things can be a bit of an obsession, but I think in this case, it makes sense. So, you know, with DCU, because as I said, being brutally honest about it, it the university sector is, a, is a, a market. So we're now competing in a, a market where there are 12 universities and four of which are in Dublin. So we always prided ourselves on being a little bit different. Um, but what happens is when you come up with some innovative way of teaching or of designing your modules and it works, everybody starts doing the same thing. So we are conscious that we probably need to to reinvent ourselves a bit. The second is, you know, students nowadays are different from what they were 20 years ago. There are a, a huge percentage of them work part-time and they work a lot. There, there are massive issues with, with housing. So a lot of them are computing, hu are commuting huge distances. You know, so you you get situations where if you have a nine o'clock lecture, you're you're dragging students in from me or somewhere, and so they're getting up every morning at six, and um, to get a bus, you know, so that that doesn't really make any sense. The other thing then is that they're, they're growing up in a, a, a an environment that's just massively distracting. I mean, I think we all suffer from the, you know, watching Netflix with your phone at the same time. I think you know we're all we're all convinced that we're able to multitask, but we're not. So, you know, there's, there is an issue with students sitting in lecture rooms of 150 people and 
you know, a lecture, I won't say droning on, but certainly, you know, learning is hard and not everything is massively interesting. And the temptation for students to just take out the phone or open the laptop or whatever is massive. So the, the modern student is, is being taught in a very different environment and has different needs. Um, the third thing is that, you know, it's always been part of our, our, our ethos, if you like, to want to engage with industry and, and meet the needs of industry. But I think we, we, we need to enhance that. And then the last one, teaching better, that's linked to this, this um, issue around students growing up in a different environment where the COVID period has been a massive learning experience for us and made us all a little bit more open-minded about the need for change. And um, it is very hard to make a case that we should still be walking into a room of 100 students and going through PowerPoint slides. So we, we, want, to, we want to teach in a better way. So this is where the, the, the DCU Futures um, project comes in and I'm, I'm leading the, the project, the DCU Futures project in, in the faculty. Um, and that what we're doing in, in the faculty is we're, we're creating five new programs that fall under the, the DCU heading. There's one in, in, in School of Biotech, one in Chemistry, one in Physics and two in Psychology. Um, and the, all of these programs are, going, are funded through the government's Human Capital Initiative which is basically a fund to make, in, make universities um, engage with, with, with industry to fill skills gaps, basically. So um, there are, you know, everybody can argue a little bit what, what those skill gaps are, but across the university, we, we now have 10 programs, five, as I said, in the Faculty of Science and Health. Um, and the idea is that they're all going to some way address the needs of industry um, and, and business, not, not just industry. And one of the core ideas he, here is that we, we basically shake up the way we teach. And so if I just go down the bullet points there, there and I'm not, I don't want to say too much about this because some of it is, is kind of in, in process and it's, there's an element of confidentiality to it, I suppose. But there'd be a, a huge shift away from lectures and traditional labs and a far more um, emphasis on project type uh, learning and hackathons and what people call sprints and immersions and all that kind of stuff. Um, and I think these things are not easy to do. So this is, is something of an experiment, but it's something we're, we're determined to do properly and in a, an evidence-based way, because we think this has to happen. You know, there, we're still producing good graduates, but there is this issue around the fact that students are different nowadays and they, they, they're living and working in a, a massively distracting environment. So we're, we want their learning experience to be different better and much more engaging. Um, and part of that is, is a strong focus on skills. I'll talk a little bit about skills in a minute, but you know, everybody from the World Economic Forum to IBEC to, to whoever talks about the need for students to have skills, both soft and hard. Um, and I think we all know what, what people say when, when they talk about skills, but I'll, I'll elaborate on, on that in, in a minute. Um, when I say there's going to be an emphasis on skills, I'm not talking about ditching a whole pile of content and then saying, let's have modules on skills, like a module on creativity. We don't believe that's, and I think the evidence shows in the education literature that that doesn't work, that a lot of skills are quite context dependent. Uh, problem solving would be a perfect example. I mean, people talk about problem solving as a skill but it's very dependent on the context. I would claim to be a good problem solver in chemical engineering, but ask me a problem to do with some legal matter and I wouldn't have a clue. So, so we're not talking about abandoning what's been tried and tested. We're, we're just trying to place a more emphasis on skills and actually just make the development of skills more explicit in our modules. Um, we also want to have a certain amount of online delivery 
part of that is to suit us because demographically our numbers are going to increase hugely over the next 10 years and our campuses are, are limited in their capacity, but also to suit students because students want that kind of flexibility. So we would see a situation where, for example, students might have what we call Cyber Monday or Cyber Friday, where they don't have to come onto campus because they can do all their online learning. Um, within the School of, of Biotech, where we've already shifted to a nine month intra and that has suited everybody, students, but particularly employers, because obviously the, the training in time is a smaller fraction of, of the total working time. So everybody's happy with that. And then we want strong industry engagement. Um, I'll, I'll elaborate on that in a sec. So I don't know why that's doing that. Okay. So in terms of the skills, I think these are the sort of, I don't want to call them buzzwords, but they're the sort of things that we want to focus on. Um, the top ones there are kind of softish kind of skills and the, the bottom ones then would be kind of more related to content and, and technical knowledge, as I said about problem solving. But even something like creativity, it's something I try to, to I suppose, encourage in, in my modules by, I suppose, posing students problems for which there are multiple answers and rewarding answers on the basis of their originality if like rather than for example if you say ask a student how do you enhance oxygen transfer in a bioreactor there's some very obvious ways of doing that but there are also some not so obvious ways of doing that so you know again it's not a question of teaching creativity and getting people around a table with with marshmallows and, and spaghetti or something it's about embedding these ideas within the content um, and then in terms of the softer kind of skills, the working in teams aspect is going to be a major part of, of, of what we do in, in the futures programs. And you're talking about communication, time management, all those kind of things, and even leadership. And we're not talking about, you know, we're, we're not imagining our students leaving college and going into CEO positions. We're talking about them to be able to lead a group of three or four people. So one of the things we've tried to do over the years in biotech, but it's it's always been a bit of a problem because of student numbers, is anytime there's a group activity, in it, whether it's in a module or whatever, that one of the group has to be group leader and has to manage the troops, if you like, for, for a day or for even a week. So we're, we're trying to embed a lot of these things. And I think that's that's the key word. It's not, it's not having modules that are dedicated to skills because, the evidence shows that they don't work. They they don't they don't transfer uh, from one discipline to another. So, in terms of the, the futures program, what have we come up with? We've we we decided. Um, we we went went through a lot of different ideas. We talked about bioinformatics and all sorts of things, but we went for the BSc in bioprocessing because that's what we were hearing from industry really. And I was at a webinar run by IBEC last week and um, they gave the list of, of skills required for the, for the pharma sector was actually, and bioprocessing was at the top. So we, we believe this is, is something that we should pursue. And just to give you a sense of where bioprocessing fits in terms of our, our existing programs, I mean, if you think of, we're an unusual department in that we're, we're We've a bunch of chemical engineers and we've a lot of biologists. And over on the biology side there, we have the BSc in genetics and cell biology. Um, we're hoping at some stage in the future to develop a, a degree in bioprocess engineering and that will be done in collaboration with, with mechanical engineering. The BSc in biotechnology is about here or possibly even closer. And Graduates who came through the, the BSc in biotechnology in the 90s, you were probably over here somewhere. But what has happened is this BSc in biotech has kind of shifted gradually towards biology. And that has, there are very good reasons for that. I mean, if you think about the developments in biology in the last 20 years, they've been phenomenal. Um, so from being a truly interdisciplinary program with a, a really good mix of biology and process engineering, 
the BSc in biotechnology, although it's still really successful and our graduate employment rates are very high, is, is more of a, a degree in biology with some bioprocess engineering. So we wanted to create, and this is a little bit of back to the future to, to some extent, that the BSc in bioprocessing would, would be a shift back towards engineering. Um, and the other thing we wanted to do was to, to make it not so um, um, not so focused on biopharma because again there's no point in having five degree programs all training students or educating students for the same sector yeah, so so that was the basic concept um, and i suppose i like this <laughs> it's one of my favorite scenes in the movie it's from finding nemo when the, the fish all escape from the the tank and the end down in the sea and then they're still stuck in the little bags of water but 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 now what so that's all been a bit, bit of a preamble that we're developing this new degree in bioprocessing we i don't want to call it bioprocess engineering because it, it won't be an accredited program by the institute of engineers or, or whatever um so the question is how do we pursue this now i forget what my next slide is about okay at the moment, I've, I've, I've produced an outline program structure, every single module, and I'm producing documentation, documentation to go through the university's accreditation um, procedures. So that requires me to really, well, fill out a big form, basically. So it'll be 30 page form with module descriptors for every single module. Um, and we're going to get some external expertise from Europe. Um, and I suppose the thing about what I've designed is, as the politician said, I think it was Emmett Stagg said, this is cast in stone, but for the time being, you know, so what I've, I've produced is, is really still a concept. Um, I obviously believe in it, but um, because we want this, because this is so, um, we're so interested in this being industry focused and and really connected to industry. You know, I'm an academic. I've I've been in academia all my life. I I could well be, you know, missing loads of stuff here, or I could have stuff in 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 the program that shouldn't be there. So the first thing I suppose, and I might as well just say what what we want from industry is. First of all, we we would want advice on whether we're on the right track here. Um, and I'm not gonna share the program here. I think that's something that, that could happen down the line. Um, and what we're really looking for is just really serious engagement. And I'm not looking for just people coming in from industry, uh, you know, and giving talks and talking about their career or the business. We, we want more than that. Th those things are great and, and they do have an impact on students. But we want industry to be actually involved. Now, I'm not saying we'll obviously do all the, the real administrative work associated with all of this, but we, we do want people to actually sit down with us and co-design modules. So I might have a working title of, say, I don't know, problem solving in, in bioprocess engineering or, or, or you know, bioreactor design and control, something like that. Um, and I think that's a module worth having, but we would like industry involvement to flesh out the details of, of that module. Um, we'd also like industry being involved in delivery of modules. And that's, again, that's not necessarily given lectures. And it's, um, it, it's more because we're gonna have so much project work, we would really like industry to have, to, to come in as mentors for students and advisors to students. And one of the great things about the last year has been that a lot of these things now are possible to do remotely. So it's not a question of, you know, you having to down tools and, and find your way to DCU. It's these things can all be done remotely through Zoom or Teams or whatever. Um, we'd also love you to be doing co-assessment. And again, that's not marking exam papers. I wouldn't inflict that particular task on anybody. It is the most boring thing you could do. Um, but it might be, for example, we, I'm planning a module in product innovation in final year. So 
we would definitely want industry involvement there and in terms of mentoring the students as they go along, but also in judging yeah, the projects. Um, one thing we definitely want would be industry focused fourth year projects. We, that is something uh, we would really like to have. And we're not talking about cutting edge genetics or cutting edge um, artificial intelligence in, in bioprocess control or that kind of thing. It's just projects that um, because we can take care of the other, you know, some of the state of the art stuff through through literature reviews and that kind of stuff. But but it's just actual projects where there are deliverables, where the student has to just get the job done. It doesn't have to be cutting edge stuff. It, it can be anything. Um, and then we would love, I mean, as I said, one of the things that permeates the, the bioprocessing degree that, that I've designed is this issue of problem solving. Um, students nowadays have a real problem with rote learning and if, if you, they, they totally lack the confidence to, to think uh, sometimes. Um, so I, I really want to embed that idea of having a scenario where you actually have to think. I think a lot of what we're talking about here when we use words like problem solving and creativity is actually encouraging students to think and not to try to just rattle off stuff that they've learned off. So we if, if we have real world, as if as if education wasn't the real world, but you know what I mean, if we had were problems that I suppose would engage students and students would, would see the need for them to solve those problems, then I, I think that would be fantastic. And, and then I think it, there is this issue around inspiring students, particularly in the early years, they, they don't have a sense of where it's all going. And I suppose academics, we can only do so much, but when students see um, and interact with, with people from industry, and I, the sort of people I'm thinking of here is not necessarily the senior managers and what I'm thinking about the, the 20 something, the 30 something um, re relatively recent graduates who can relate to students well and, and somehow engage with them in a way and almost work with them or, or mentor them you know so so these are all the things we want um and i i would hope let's stop the share there i would hope that you know if if we do this there's something in it for you as well because ultimately the quality of, of your employees is going to determine how well the company performs long term and i know i'm pretty confident we produce good graduates anyway but i, I think that's no reason just to, to, to rest on our laurels and, and say everything's grand because we know our students have weaknesses as well. And, and one of those things is their, their, the fact that they rely so much on, on memorization and, and rote learning. But, um, and some of them don't cope so well in, in when they go out there, they don't have the initiative. A lot of them do, but, but something like it, just plain initiative is something that if we could instill in our students, it's gonna, it, it will really benefit um, industry as well. So, so that's the kind of background to, to what we're looking for. Um, and as I said, I, I will probably have some kind of open day later in the year, but I just wanted to get it, make it clear of what I was really talking about when I made that post the other day. Um, at the moment we're kind of in, totally focused on getting the documentation through our what we call our education committee so we and and marketing to, to school leavers as well because these programs will only be a success if we get students to actually do them you know and unfortunately students still flock into law and medicine and, and those kind of things in their droves so selling something like bioprocessing is is not necessarily easy so um so that's the plan. I, I'm really looking forward to getting some some feedback from you before we arrange some sort of um, open day. I mean, the school is very keen to to create greater connection with industry for research as well. So I, I think that's it's not just all about these programs. Um, so I I leave it at that. And um, please remember my my email is Greg Foley at DCU .ie, or if, if if you want to just get to me through LinkedIn, that, that would be fine. Um, so I'll stop there and uh, I, I 
really, I'm really looking forward to this process because um, there's an element in education of, you know, the old Einstein saying, insanity is um, doing the same thing over and over again and, and getting a, and expecting the same result. And there are issues around education. I, I think we do have to shake things up and while also developing this connection with industry. Um, so anyway, thanks for listening. I hope I didn't rattle on for too long there. Uh, I hope my dinner isn't ruined because it's in the oven. I hope I didn't go over the 30 minutes. Anyway, thanks for listening.